People uh, have a hard time believing people these days. They want something tangible. They want to be there. They want to see it on video. Yeah, I don't know. I don't get it. That's the Albany County Assistant DA, Stephen Sharp. Uh, Tashi Mayweather, the Albany guy accused of firing a gun inside uh, Crossgates uh, last fall, acquitted of attempted murder, acquitted of uh, criminal possession of a weapon, acquitted of attempted assault, but convicted of reckless endangerment. Uh, we need to bring in a greater legal minds than ours. Uh, Paul Harding from Martin Harding Mazzotti is here. Hey, Paul, how are you? Hey, good morning, Chuck. Good morning, Kelly. So I just don't get this. They say uh, he didn't have the gun, he didn't shoot it, uh, but still he's charged with reckless endangerment. What what was the jury thinking here, do you think? So, a bit of a surprise. I uh, have a situation where uh, we've got these charges. We have a eyewitness, off-duty state police officer, who kind of says Mayweather had the gun and shot the gun. But we can also imagine all the confusion around a mall shooting and how quickly that it took place. But you've got these acquitted, 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 and then convicted of reckless endangerment. feels inconsistent, and it feels like what they call a compromise Verdict. That's what I was going to ask is, do you feel like they, they, they felt like this guy's guilty of something, but we just can't <laughs> find him guilty of the uh, of the more serious? Yeah, it, and that's kind of a, that's really not how it should be done, should it? it, it it's not. It, it's appealable to some degree. I mean, I mean, so he doesn't have a gun. Um, he doesn't cause any of the uh, damage and any, any of the attempted murder, any of that, but, but he's recklessly endangering people. How? Right. right? So, he doesn't, so he doesn't have a gun. So I think that that is the confusion around here. They were thrilled with the outcome. You could see defense counsel, Killen was thrilled with that. But ultimately, I think the next step is going to be to appeal what, what the conviction was. It, it does seem very odd, but is it possible that they just couldn't sit beyond a reasonable doubt is what we're looking at. They couldn't show yeah. beyond a reasonable doubt whether he had the gun or he didn't. And, you know, this the way his conduct was could have been considered enough for reckless endangerment because that's kind of a gray area. It's a gray area. Um, and, and I think they just didn't want to come back with all not guilties because, as, as Chuck pointed out, something went down. He was at the center of something and they just couldn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he fired that gun. I mean, if he did, you know, you're talking to spending uh, the next 15 to 20 years in, in jail, as opposed to here, sentencing is going to be two and a third to, to seven. Um, you know, and we know he's on back in jail because of parole violation, which will also be appealed because they violate the parole based on whether or not reckless endangerment is going to be enough to violate that higher parole. is also yet to be seen. Uh, the uh, Lake George trial involving the death of that poor eight-year-old uh, from California. Uh, interesting case Friday. They came back in and asked the judge, hey, is it okay if we just find verdicts on 11 of 12? What do you make from that? And they also asked, you know, for definitions on the top count, second-degree manslaughter. So break that down for us and where you think what, what's going on in the jury room. Well, number one, you got a three-week trial. You've got lots of witnesses, so I appreciate the fact that they are just taking their time and going through this. And then they get to this, what they really recognize is the difference between a substantial jail time and a lesser offense is second-degree manslaughter. So they're really trying to dig in and, and look at those specific points in there. Ultimately, um, they were worried. I guess their question was, you know, hey, how long are these sentences? And the judge said, we really can't tell you that because that gets decided by me in the second phase of this trial. So once again, they've got 11 of 12, so we know they're going to come back with a, a guilty verdict. Is it going to be manslaughter? Is it going to be criminal negligent homicide? And the difference really uh, is, a, is, is a small difference in terms of what the, that leap they have to get to, but a substantial difference when it comes to the penalty phase. Yeah, you're looking at a difference of 5 to 15 for the second-degree manslaughter versus 1 and a third to 4 for criminal negligent homicide. That's a big Game difference. changer, yeah. absolutely, yeah. all the way around. Yeah. And, but you, you and I, think there'll be convictions there here eventually? I, I think today. I think yeah. today. I think they're going to. They're so close, but they wanted to take their time in the weekend. And, and I think that thoughtful approach is what is what juries should be doing when they don't have uh, everyone sort of on board with something. But but ultimately, yeah, that that's going to be the real uh, cliffhanger. Is going to be when they get to those two counts. Which one are they going to convict them on? All right. Well, if a conviction comes in today, we'll talk to you tomorrow. I'll be ready. Thanks, Thanks a lot, guys. Paul. Paul Harding, our legal analyst from Martin Harding Mazzotti, 1-800-LAW-1010.